Thank you very much, and thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm very excited. We have one of Japan's foremost labor economists, one of Japan's foremost entrepreneurs, and one of America's foremost economists, all on the same panel, so I'm really excited. This is going to be fun. Um, I've asked uh, each panelist uh, to give about a five-minute presentation of what they think the key issues are in labor markets uh, now and going forward. Uh, and then I'll raise a few points uh, at, uh, as we go along and get comments from them and then open things up for questions and answers at the end of the session. Uh, so if I may, uh, let's start with uh, Professor uh, Nagasen and get her view on what the future of the labor market looks like. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting opportunity. Uh, of course, the most, in, most uh, difficult thing about Japan is the declining population and the lack of labor force. So what we have to do is to let women have job, both uh, family and career, both men and women, and also that the elderly be able to work more uh, and make use of their productivity, as well as to have foreign workers within our J Japanese uh, society. And in order to do this, what we need to do is really change the Japanese type of employment system. This is a very profound, large change that was very difficult to do. I have been doing, I have been doing research about womanomics. I have been doing research about how women can both have career or family, or men too. And the, the Japanese employment practice, uh, you have, you have, in order for you to pro, pro be promoted, you have to get in the big firm, you have to work till very late, you have to compete age of like 30, 34, to, to, to be the first kacho. Uh, um, <laughs> and uh, so that, that's something that's really important. And you, you will be reallocated. And for, for a bank, for example, you will be tell, told just one week prior where you're going. And this is very difficult if you're, both your husband and wife is in this career track. How can you form family? So, uh, as, but uh, it's kind of an asset that you, you put in the firm and uh, you will be evaluated up until how you work till like 34, 35, and then you promote it. So th this, is, uh, this system used to work well like in 1980s, or maybe up to 1990s, at least early 1990s, or I, we don't know, but we know that we really need to change, and we are comparing American system with Japanese system. Because I'm doing labor about women, I think occupational career building by one's own self, uh, self uh, initiative is much better for women or much better for foreign workers. But, uh, but, but good companies have this kind of road for men, you know, career track for men where they, you compete with the same year entrance, you know. It's very rigid uh, competition uh, and, and some uh, protection too. For, for men, and how are we going to change it? I think we need to change the personnel department. I have been in the personnel department um, career uh, learning <laughs> uh, groups where they were trying to learn how to make, promote women, how to change the firm culture. And Japanese human resource department is quite good at learning from each other, but they're learning from each other the Japanese style that their learning ability is kind of limited to a very, very similar style. And the, the personnel department has still has quite strong uh, uh, um, initiative or uh, decision process in recruiting or promotion yet, according to papers. So uh, uh, it's very important to change the personnel department. In order to change this personnel department, I think we should form a group of learning session where the new type of like uh, occupational career building system, how the career is formed in such kind of system. So, uh, Can you give us some specific suggestions? How would you reform? If you're a consultant, you go to a big company and say, okay, this HR department is not functioning uh, sufficiently well, what would you recommend that they do? Change the criteria? What? Okay, okay. Uh, I went to the U.S. and learned about how the U.S. recruit the, 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 mm -hmm. and you have local job market, you have the price listed, and for, for each job, you, you, will, you have this price range and the skill range that you're going to recruit, which is quite different from our system. 
our system, it's, it's kind of growing these people up from when they enter. So I, I think we need to, uh, it's, so, it's difficult to change everything at once. So uh, I think we need to have this, this uh, traditional track as well as this new recruiting track. For, for professionals and specialists, and try to uh, enlarge this, this part. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. So, uh, basically, uh, it's um, called HR Kaikaku. HR Kaikaku. Uh, no, including uh, non-standard workers. HR is only focusing on standard workers, but uh, to, to include non-standard workers as well. Okay, thanks very much. Uh, Minami-san, you're actually involved in this data bank. You're a fire, you're intermediate. Yeah. What are your observations? Thank you. Um, you know, the future work uh, is a word uh, I use a lot uh, throughout my, my work I do at uh, BizReach. You know, looking back at uh, not our company's journey, but my personal journey, I think is a good reflection of how I reform myself. I actually grew up in Canada from age 6 to 13, and I had to come back to Japan because of my dad's work. So when I came back to public school, or public junior high school, in Shizuoka back in the 80s, <laughs> yeah. man, a lot of the Japanese people smiled. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, uh, like going to a new star in Star Trek movie. <laughs> so I had to shave my head, put my name on my uh, t-shirt, with my, so my social security number. <laughs> so I asked my mom if I was a prisoner, by the way. But uh, after going through public high school um, and spending five years in the Japanese education system, I went back to the US uh, for college. I went to Tufts in Boston. Um, and for me, I get this question a lot. I've always been a minority. I went to an all-Caucasian elementary school. I went to a Japanese public, in, uh, public junior high and high school but I wasn't Japanese in the inside. There was this movie, Rich, uh, Crazy Rich Asians, right? I saw last night because I'm going to the US today to laugh about it. But, you know, uh, yeah, I wasn't Japanese inside at a very Japanese public school. And then I had to go back to the US to relearn, not just English, because my English had stopped at grade seven, but relearn the American culture. And it was a relearning process. It was a relearning process, throwing myself into a a new environment or a new culture and trying to understand what was happening around me. Um, after I graduated from, from school, I joined Morgan Stanley and Robbie was the, were you a chief economist? Yes. Yeah, he was a chief economist and I was a financial analyst first year out of school. So this is an honor uh, being on the same panel with my ex-boss. <laughs> but after Morgan Stanley and in the financial world, um, my last job, I was a founder of Japan's first expansion baseball team, the Rakuten Eagles. So I went from finance, I went to professional baseball or professional sports, and nine years ago when I was starting this company, you know, when I start a new business, it's always about setting the agenda. What, what, what is the problem? What is the problem? And I enjoyed working. I don't know about you guys, I enjoy working. <laughs> because I have fun with it. I, re I learn, I relearn, you know, I set, you know, uh, goals, and I tried to achieve it. And that's what I've been doing since I was a kid. You know, set goals, relearn, readjust, set new goals, relearn, readjust. And when I tried starting, uh, when I was thinking about starting a company, th that became my agenda for Japan. You know, how do I open up options and opportunities to empower Japanese to understand that work can be fun if you readjust, relearn, reset new goals, and understand what's going around them. And that's always been, you know, our goal as a company for BizReach, trying to reform what Nagasa-san just mentioned, this very static, very concrete, like hard labor market, and give everyone an understanding of what's happening around them. You know, the, the, na the neighbor's lawn always, look green, always looks greener, right? But it's not like you need to change jobs, but it's good to, to know what's, going, what's happening around you, what your market value is, what skills you're valuable with, what skills you're not valuable with. You know, and what I'm saying is happening around the world, and we're a little bit behind. We're just a little bit behind. And hopefully through our business and through our discussion today, I can talk a little bit about uh, what I see through my eyes. You mentioned that you really enjoy working. So do I.
when I saw the uh, work style reform, the Hatakai Kaku, uh, a few uh, months ago, I said, wait a minute, these guys are telling me that I can't work more than a certain amount? <laughs> what is your evaluation of, of that uh, reform? I think it's uh, a little bit of, you know, stage management. I think we're, like I said before, we're at a, we're a very static labor market right now. And when you, a lot of people talk, talk about the productivity, se san se, uh, in the uh, reform kind of agenda discussions. And it's a simple calculation, right? It's how much output you have or how much profit you make divided by how much time you spend because you, we only live 24 hours, seven days a week. So I think it's the first kind of pillar or the entrance uh, hurdle that we need to clear. And I think little by little, as we go forward, as we move from a manufacturing-centric country to a more service-oriented you know, country in terms of GDP or economy, I think this time issue is something that the government or everyone in the mindset of the Japanese needs to change. So I, I, I think personally I think it's, although from a big picture, it's a very small branch of what needs to happen, mm -hmm. but you know, we need to start somewhere. It's like a startup. Okay. Thanks, you're very kind uh, to them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. Um, Daniel, can I ask you for your perspective? Daniel is quite an expert on AI, on cybersecurity, stuff like that, and so I'm looking forward to this. No, um, thank you for, I hope this is on. Uh, so first of all, uh, thank you so much, Robbie, uh, uh, for inviting me, and uh, thank you to the conference organizers, um, uh, uh, uh to be here. Um, yeah, I thought I would uh, speak a little bit about um, uh, some research that I've been uh, uh, doing a lot over the last uh, uh, couple months to years uh, on artificial intelligence. Um, so I, growing up as a kid, um, really liked shows like Doraemon mm -hmm. and uh, um, Gundam and uh, uh, Tetsujin uh, Nijihachi, if anyone remembers that. Um, uh, so, you know, this uh, Japan has long been a kind of cultural pioneer in terms of thinking about uh, the rise of robotics mm. and, and the rise of artificial intelligence. But it's been fascinating to see the reality of what uh, the rise of AI looks like versus um, what we conceived um, in uh, science fiction, uh, what it would look like uh, 20, 30 years ago. Um, and uh, this brings to a very important distinction between uh, what uh, uh, computer scientists and statisticians differentiate between broad AI um, and narrow AI. So I think a lot of the science fiction sort of focused on broad AI, um, artificial intelligence that mimicked human behavior, um, you know, robots that actually tried to do the things um, that humans do cognitively. And actually, there's been very disappointing progress uh, mm. on the broad AI front. Um, all of the exciting advances have been in the narrow AI front. And in the narrow AI front is distinguished by not trying to do everything that a human can do, but trying to see, can we improve you know, certain very specific kinds of cognitive prediction problems? Mm. I would say it's the statistical or cognitive equivalent of not building a human-shaped robot, um, but like a, maybe a, a robot arm or something uh, that you see. It can do only certain specific kinds of tasks very well. Okay. Mm. And there we have seen incredible uh, progress in terms of image recognition, uh, language, natural language processing, um, and so on. And it's still early days uh, in uh, the AI revolution. What does this mean for, for labor markets? So I think the first thing, which is good news, is that this vision of you know, robots stealing jobs and taking over what humans will do and so on, um, I think it's um, a, a, a large exaggeration. Um, <laughs> instead, I think what's going to happen is a lot of these narrow AI tools are going to be serving as very important complements that can help augment and enhance uh, what humans are able to do. Mm. But then this brings me to the final point that uh, I'm looking forward to discussing with all the panelists, is that what is the main uh, resource that drives um, advances in narrow AI? It's data. And uh, data is now becoming this uh, very interesting resource that's not quite capital, it's not quite labor, but it's something in between. 
And so in terms of kind of concrete steps um, in, in terms of how this might transform um, uh, the future of work, um, I think the, there's some very exciting research being done by um, uh, digital economists who are thinking about uh, new incomes, uh, people's incomes that can come from the provision of data. Uh, rather than the provision of labor or the provision of capital. You know, all of you now um, are valuable data providers um, uh, to uh, you know, the, the, the Facebooks and, and lines of the world. Um, and, and the provision of that data allows these companies to solve very hard, narrow AI problems. Right? And so far, all of this, you are being compensated for that um, through the access to the network, right? You're kind of being paid in kind um, by being able to, you know, have the pleasure of posting your photos on Instagram and sharing with all of your friends. But as an economist would say, um, where's the price mechanism in this, right? Um, where um, is there some way where instead of this barter system by which um, uh, people provide data and in turn get paid in kind, um, can there actually be wages um, uh, uh, being uh, provided, more direct ways of compensating people uh, for their labor? I think it's, um, uh, uh, you know, I don't have any concrete answers for this, but uh, uh, there are, there's a lot of you know, uh, interesting policy questions now emerging uh, about these digital platform companies and how they should be treating the resource of data, how it should, obviously they should be focusing on privacy and ownership, but also how to start thinking about compensating people um, for the provision of, uh, of, of data um, as a labor source. Hey, thanks. Actually, you've raised a very interesting, intriguing um, equivalence between data and resources here. You're a resource economist. You know a lot about energy, about oil, about gas. Mm. What are the similarities and differences between data as a resource and oil as a resource? Mm. Mm. Yeah. Um, so I'm so happy you asked that because mm. it's something that I've been <laughs> this was not uh, trying to, to wrap my head around for, for a long time. Um, so the difference between data and uh, a kind of standard physical commodity like oil, say, um, there are some key similarities and I think some key differences. So um, let's start with the differences. The difference is, of course, that um, a barrel of oil um, is, from a chemical and physical sense, relatively indistinguishable um, across things. I mean, yes, there are differences chemically between a barrel of oil that comes from Saudi Arabia versus a barrel of oil that comes from Texas, but for all practical purposes, um, it's the same combination of carbon and, hydro, uh, and hydrogen atoms uh, uh, linked into you know, molecular chains, and that's where the value comes from. Um, that means that uh, the market for this thing is global in nature. However, with data, I would say, um, the, the value of the data comes from its uniqueness mm. from it, right? It's not like um, the, oh, I hope, uh, that uh, the data profile that I can provide to a platform is very different from the data uh, that, you know, um, that you provide mm -hmm. um, uh, because it is a reflection of you know, my, my tastes, my, my habits, and, and all this stuff. And so the value comes from the uniqueness of it um, uh, and not from the standardization of it. And yet, th this is where the similarity comes from. It is also global, completely global in nature. Um, uh, it's not like um, uh, uh, it has to, uh, you know, it, it's a physical presence that has to, you know, move across uh, uh, kind of boundaries. Um, these platforms are inherently multinational and, and globalist in nature. And you know, I think for certain important questions around medicine or around uh, um, uh, you know, uh, various uh, aspects of human society, it doesn't really matter whether the data came from the United States or from Japan or from France or, or whoever. So it is also a completely globally integrated market. Um, and that's, I think, a key similarity with, uh, with physical commodity markets. OK, thanks. We have about 15 hours of interesting <laughs> work to do on that one, too. But let me switch to a few of the questions that I have given to our panelists just to, to comment on. Uh, first of all, I think uh, all of our panelists uh, uh, mentioned the notion of retraining and that we have to get people retrained for a different uh, kind of world. 
so, uh, Professor Nagasen, may I ask you, where do you think the uh, bottlenecks are in our education system in getting people trained and retrained to do these jobs of the future? Okay, I, I wasn't expecting this question. <laughs> um, uh, trained and retrained. Well, uh, I thought it was more broadly about education. Okay, that's fine. Is that that's fine. fine. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I, ha I am a mother of two children, and they are already grown-ups. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have been uh, looking at how to raise children in the Japanese system or in other systems. And we have many strengths in the Japanese system. For example, the, the PISA grade is very, uh, on average, high. And uh, there's not that much uh, you know, bad, bad results, even though, uh, and uh, so, um, and if you live in the US or in Australia, for example, you will know that the Japanese system is much more trustworthy in a sense, <laughs> that uh, people come at the time when they should, and you can trust that uh, things will be fixed as they should. So uh, I think the, there is a good quality of education in Japan. However, uh, it has been quite much dependent on mothers. Uh, early in 2002, around uh, only 20 to 25 percent of mothers were at work when they had first child and the rest was, was without work and devoted to child rearing. And 2008 or 9, it was around 30% for university graduate women. And in 2015, it's about near 50% who has, who, has not, who has not only work, but uh, permanent work. It's nearing 50%. So the education or raising children scenery is changing very, very rapidly. <laughs> Whereas the daycare center is not enough, and it's quite crowded, and with long hours, and a husband is now trying to take their own share, but the corporate culture is also not that uh, uh, stimulate. I mean, supported, supported. So um, we are now facing really a change in how to raise children, very rapid change which is not really, really uh, data tested. What is the good hours? What is the good uh, nursery uh, uh, environment? And uh, the, the, especially in Tokyo, mm -hmm. kindergarten is being changed to what is called kodomoen, mm -hmm. because kindergarten, is, uh, demand is declining, and daycare demand is increasing. So they are kind of combining kindergarten and uh, daycare. But the, uh, but the kindergarten used to um, uh, so encourage mothers to stay home. So kindergarten used to say that, OK, mothers, you have to make this kind of lunch box. Mothers, you have to make this kind of needlework. <laughs> and uh, now in those environment, the daycare center is, is attached. And uh, so. We really need to rethink how education should be in this new environment. So this is one point. And the second point is about university education. University education, I, I, I was at Harvard and Cornell in 2013-14, and I thought that they are brilliant. <laughs> and I think we need to do much more reform in this uh, education. And uh, also, uh, especially in the new area, such as AI, data analysis, computers, I'm sure we have very strong base, but still I, I think we need to take up new, this new, new IT technology much quicker. Mm -hmm. So, so mm -hmm. that's about the point. So those are two bottlenecks. One is university education, one is uh, early uh, mm -hmm. kindergarten education. Daniel, if I may ask you, uh, from your point of view, where are the bottlenecks that need uh, to be broken? Yeah, um, no, it's a, an excellent question and something that um, I personally have received a lot of opinions about because <laughs> both my uh, uh, both my parents are educators; uh, uh, they're math teachers. Um, so I, I, I agree with what uh, Professor Nagase said. Uh, certainly, um, so um, 
I went to college at Princeton and I discovered uh, recently that computer science has just surpassed economics as the most popular major. <laughs> um, well, I hope economics will we'll come back. Um, but actually, uh, so obviously more emphasis on uh, you know, STEM education, on computer science and data science and statistics um, are all very valuable. But I think it's going to be even more broad than uh, just emphasis, more emphasis on a particular kind of subject. Um, it needs to be more flexible now. I mean, it's sort of, again, part of this theme of, uh, you know, people now providing value to the economy um, in uh, more flexible ways than, you know, working at the same company for 30, 40 years. Um, it's going to require then also people to be able to transform their internal human capital more dynamically uh, to respond to a dynamic economy. Um, and that um, is going to mean, and I'm sure um, uh, many of you are already familiar with this concept of uh, uh, lifelong learning or recurrent uh, learning, um, uh, the rise of uh, you know, online courses. Um, I have taken many online courses um, uh, recently myself. Um, uh, you know, this process where it's no longer, um, you know, going through the standard education system and then your, edu your formal education is complete and now you are just entering the labor force and uh, uh, gaining work experience. I don't think that you know, the rigidities in that system is going to give way to a much more, again, dynamic system of continued human capital appreciation all throughout uh, one's entire life. Uh, a friend of mine in the diet said something very interesting yesterday. He was having a discussion about wages. And uh, the question is, why isn't wages, go aren't wages going up? Okay. Well, in fact, wages for people, he says, and I, it's a good point, wages for people in the free labor markets are going up. La wages for people in the controlled labor markets, the lifelong employment, are not going up. So shouldn't we have more liquidity? Because then people who change jobs become more valuable. Okay? So this is a, a liquidity issue mm -hmm. uh, that I think is, is quite, uh, quite important. Uh, let me ask uh, Nagasa-san uh, uh, the next question here. Do HR departments understand that liquidity in labor markets is a good thing? Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 liquidity in a sense that they don't want to lose the best talent, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they want to recruit better talent. Mm -hmm. So uh, liquidity, and also uh, in Japan, liquidity often means low wage in, act in actuality. So they want to make use of these low wage people. Uh, so uh, I think the HR people really mm -hmm. differentiates between the what we call insiders and outsiders. Right. And uh, <coughs> this is a point where um, things should really mm -hmm. make changes. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is connected not only to the labor market, it's connected to university system, it's connected to uh, a gender role within the family. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really a kind of a very, very uh, stubborn stubborn base mm -hmm. but uh, I, I have been advocating for more liquidity for many years mm -hmm. but many uh, male labor economists were against it they thought that the mm -hmm. Japanese system has its its good point and I agree it does have good points but uh, it's it's coming to a point when you if you want to make better use of women or to elderly or the foreign workers you really need the fundamental change mm -hmm. And we are in the, the stage where we really have to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a phrase, tekzai tekshou, the right person in the right job, uh, which is exactly what it seems to me that our HR departments kind of don't want because their own um, what was it, um, evaluation within their own firms is based on exactly what you say, keeping the more talented people, whether you pay them right or wrong. In a way, they're acting as monopolists. Mm -hmm. And what uh, I think this reach is trying to do is break down some of those monopolies. Uh, is that a, a, a reasonable way to think about it? Well, that's a perfect word to phrase it. I think it's just easier. Uh, for example, my dad worked at Yamaha for 40 years, and I talk to him sometimes. He says, and he's, he has two kind of opinions, two sided opinion on what we're trying to do. One, he says that, one, I'm jealous of your generation because you guys have options and opportunities in your career that we didn't have as a generation 
If you dropped out of your company, you're an outsider. You, you were seen as an outsider, you, get, you don't get to you know, attend all the social circles, you're looked at very you know, awkwardly. But at the same time, he told me that our generation was very lucky because we didn't have to think about other things that you guys need to think about. Because I focused on how to grow my company. I focused on how to build Yamaha globally. He built like Africa, India, and uh, South America. And I didn't even consider working for another company until I retired. And that's why I was able to focus on, although there were a lot of politics inside of who was going to take each chair in the revolving chairs in, my, in his classmate, within his classmates, but it was very simple, you know. And HR departments are employers, there's a lot of employers, employers, it's more complicated if you don't have a monopoly. Look at some of the com countries that are run or operated under a monopoly. It's probably easier for them and it's more lucrative economically for them to, be, to have a monopoly if you're at the top of the pyramid. So, you know, obviously we need to break through if we want to break through. I mean, I'm not saying that we need to break through. Maybe you want to break through. I think I want to break through as a country, but a lot of people who are in certain positions rather keep a monopoly and run it the old way. And that's human nature. I'm not blaming people about it. How is the U.S. changing? Is it a monopoly now? <laughs> um. If, I, if you gave me 24 hours, I might uh, be able to just scratch at the surface of answering that question. Um, I'll, I'll t say a little bit about, I think, some exciting things uh, that are happening in the U.S., and not just the U.S., but, but everywhere. Um, I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this. Um, the rise of the so-called gig economy, mm. right? Um, uh, of a, a class of workers that are not full-time, but they're not you know, pure autobites either. Right, um, uh, you know, people who you know, derive um, a substantial amount or even all of their income, um, but but providing their labor on demand, right, um, as enabled through um, technology uh, and through matching platforms, right. Um, this is creating a lot of policy discussion and and and, and economist uh, economic discussion uh, in in the U.S. Um, uh, and uh, uh, you know. Uh, a lot of people are proposing ways of finding some right balance uh, between, uh, you know, providing, you know, health insurance and uh, uh, you know, other safety nets that usually come alongside uh, uh, full-time employment, but at the same time having the flexibility sort of needed um, uh, so that uh, they can fit well into this kind of on-demand system. Um, it's another, I think, way in which, as we were all talking about, you know, technology and, and the nature, the, the changing nature of, of our economy, um, which is um, now much less manufacturing driven and much more services driven, um, is going to um, change our interaction with it. Just one final aside, um, I'm, I'm uh, pleased you kind of uh, were Describing the kind of human capital as uh, an asset to to invest in um, at at a national level, um, there was a uh, World Bank report uh, recently that sort of tried to trace um, the the greatest sources of wealth creation um, uh, uh, throughout the global economy over the last 20 years, and it's not infrastructure, it's not um, you know buildings, um, it was. Human capital creation uh, was the single largest source um, of, of wealth creation um, in the world. Which brings up another topic I want to uh, ask uh, our uh, panelists. I've been looking and looking and looking and looking for some good calculations on the rate of return to education. <laughs> in an education textbook that I uh, was using for my lectures at Tokyo University of Science, uh, I came across one book that said, uh, that the rate of return on college education in Japan uh, is the lowest of any industrial country. <laughs> um, say you're probably the, the, the chief expert on this kind of thing. Um, what is your view on the rate of return of education? 
Well, I, I just read a paper. It's about eight percent per year, mm -hmm. and uh, in in the U.S., the rate of education, mm -hmm. well, usually the return on education usually uh, come to a decline after you you have so so the elementary education return is highest, mm -hmm. and if you it's additionally more education, the return will get smaller. But what's happening in the U.S. is that mm -hmm. this return on education is now coming uh, the Concave? Steeper. Yeah, mm -hmm. concave. Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, really? No, 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 no. This way. So return on low education is low, return on high education is high. Uh, in the U.S., the return on professional education, or PhD, is really rising in, mm -hmm. in 1990s mm -hmm. and 2000s, especially 2000s. And mm -hmm. this kind of change is occurring in uh, English-speaking countries, most notably. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Japan, it's not... It's it's not that that much, mm -hmm. and uh, actually I'm doing research about uh, income contingent student loan, mm. like in what is being made in Australia, UK, where you have loan and then you repay when you have a certain more than certain amount of income, mm -hmm. and. Uh, in doing this, I, I, I wrote it in Nikkei newspaper, but uh, we found a profound difference in income between male university graduate and female university yes. graduates. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. My guess is that the reason Japan was so low is we have a large number of very well-educated women who aren't working. <laughs> <laughs> what a waste. Okay. Yeah. Um, so one other thing, if I may bring up a couple points on monopoly and bring in the IT uh, issue. A couple other things I learned uh, have been, uh, first of all, uh, nurses in the U.S. are very low paid. And one of the reasons for this uh, is that there are very strong local monopolies in hospitals. Okay? There aren't a lot of hospitals in any particular region. Uh, typically, the nurses aren't mobile among regions, so they have to work at that hospital, and so their wages go down. There's a monopoly. The hospital has a monopoly on hiring. So that's something that needs to be addressed. Another thing that was an impact, and I want to check with you guys on this, see if you think it's correct, but the, the impact of IT on wages differs between white and blue collar. And the blue collar guys are the beneficiaries. So if you're a plumber and there's a new you know, app, uh, you know, plumber demand app in your locality, the supply of plumbers doesn't go up very fast. But the demand for plumbers goes up real fast because everybody can find out or can register their demand right there. So there's a local monopoly of plumbers, maybe not a monopoly, but a, a constricted supply. So the impact of IT on blue collar jobs has been positive, whereas for white collar jobs it's been negative. Uh, so for example, if you want a Japanese English translation, you can get on an app somewhere and find somebody somewhere, anywhere around the world, who can do that for you. So those call it knowledge based uh, wages have been pushed down by IT, whereas the blue collar wages have been pushed up. This was the assertion uh, in this book that I saw about. Does that make sense to you? I don't have uh, a personal opinion on it, but I'm trying to figure out, maybe on the, the white collar side, there's two aspects as well. I think, you know, when I always talk about productivity, especially to Japanese, I talk about the Meiji Restoration 160 years ago. Japan, or a monopoly, Japan was a monopoly during the Edo period until 1850 something, 1850, 1858. And what happened back then was it was run by a samurai who had swords, who had their chomage, their specific hairstyle. And what happened during the Meiji Restoration was that it opened up. It, it became an open market. And the government back then did, did, did a great job of going to the West, to, to Europe and the US, to import new ways of thought, technologies, and systems. And they brought that in, and in 30 years, Japan caught up. And th that, that's how I see Japan in the 21st century. Meaning that technology is the biggest driver of change of society, or the biggest driver of productivity. So technically, I think what you're saying is right, but what will happen on the white collar side is exactly what you, what you just mentioned with the white and blue collar side. It is going to, you know, the technology is going to drive white collar productivity and the people who want to go with it will go up. The people who won't abide by it will go down because the summarize that they didn't go with the technologies or the new ways of thought, 
they all went to Kagoshima to talk with Saigo Takamori and raise him and they got all killed by the Meiji army in like few few weeks. You know, but people, they relearned too. The samurais who died relearned, re-educated themselves. They set themselves in the new social environment and raised their productivity and as a country went up as a whole. So I'm always an avid supporter of openness, of markets, and I believe in the Japanese that the Japanese are willing to change if they have to. But they just need a push in the back with support from the outside, as always. And we need to have a crisis, right? <laughs> just like everybody else. Um, on the point of Meiji, if I can uh, do a, a little bit of an advertisement for a friend's book, there's a, a woman who was the number two person at the OECD uh, for a while. She had a, a great-grandfather who was a missionary in Meiji, Japan. His diary uh, was the subject of a book, and she did a lot of historical research on this. The English book came out about uh, three years ago. Uh, it's called um, A Christian in the Land of the Gods. Uh, and it gives you a very strong sense of what it was like to, to work and live in Meiji, Japan. One of the key contributions of that missionary community was women's education. The, at the um, elementary school level, at the junior, middle, high school level, college level, uh, it was, there was a lot of missionary influence uh, in getting women educated. So that's a perfect example of how a monopoly was broken uh, and uh, the, the uh, country improved. More news, uh, there's a Japanese version of the book that will come out, in fact it's out already. Uh, it's called, I think, Watakushi no Kazuku no Meiji Jidai. It's uh, sort of on the bookshelves now and it's a fascinating book because you just learn how uh, this particular corner of the society opened up and became more more productive. So I have to go into Q and A now. Uh, so let me open the floor to any questions that anyone has. Start here. Thank you. One of the challenge I thought was uh, appraisal system. Uh -huh. I, um, uh, I I I saw that the Japanese are worst appraiser in the world <laughs> because uh, all appraisers seat coming back to me, all sang, all young. And average or slightly more than average, and it's very difficult to distinguish good and excellent and unique from standard people. So, how can we change this mindset? <laughs> uh, uh, because it's a long, lifelong employment system, if you mark somebody low, you are still with him, you know, for a long time. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the American system, both can fire or hire, whereas in Japan, HR hires and they are there and only allocated here and there. So within this Japanese system, it's, it's, it's kind of difficult to really, in my view, because it, it, it's a long-term relationship is very different in the market-based uh, market uh, system as is well known in economics. And Japan has been very good at long-term system which made high quality and high devotion. But uh, as you say, so maybe we, we need to make, uh, I, I don't know if I should say it, but maybe make firing a bit easier. And also change in the social protection system because human has to be protected too and re-educated too. So change the system. Yeah, I didn't say that. She said that. <laughs> I'll say it too. One of the most important potential labor reforms coming here is what we call uh, kinsen kaikatsu or monetary compensation for dismissal. Large firms have it, but it's very high. There's no protection for uh, small firms at all. And what we need is a national standard of what constitutes fair compensation for dismissal. Once we have that, it'll be much easier to move around. Going back also to your question, I met a fascinating guy the other day. In his firm, he's done a brilliant thing uh, to um, help with the evaluation system. He has six tiers of evaluation levels, so from one to, to six. Okay? It's an even number. The reason it's an even number is that you can't be average. Wow. You're either above average or you're below average. Mm. And if you were evaluated below average, they cut your pay. So if that happens to you a few years in a row, you quit. <laughs> so there's a way to design the incentives in the system 
link it up with this evaluation that you say, that will actually encourage this kind of labor, uh, labor mobility. So I thought I'd introduce that little idea. Yes, in the back. Yeah. I was intrigued by um, the panel, one member of the panel, discussing education as tax management. Uh, and indeed, return on investment is clearly important, and money does make the world go round. But at the same time, this philosophy of learning in order to earn uh, is potentially in danger, one might suggest, of losing some spiritual, cultural, and social dimensions, mm -hmm. without which society will be very much the poorer. Mm -hmm. We can earn as much as we want, but if we don't have those, we're lost. Good point. What are the externalities in education? We, we can talk about the, uh, was it the, the earning power, but what is the, the sort of the externality of having a well-educated population? I think that's part of what you're getting at in economic yeah. terms. Uh, you know, I don't want to play you know, the devil's advocate here because I totally understand where you're coming from, but I try to quantize everything. What is the quantity, what is the ROI of what you just mentioned? As a country, I, I want to live in a safe, very high context cultural society too, but I'm willing to pay for that. How, how much are we willing to pay for that? How much are we willing, out of the 100% that we can learn, how much are we willing to pay for that in terms of education? Is 70% tax, 30%, you know, 10% culture, 10% ethics, 10% having fun? You know, I think a lot of countries are going through that right now, but we don't have this discussion in Japan. That, 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 that's the problem that I want to open up to through my business or through society or through what I talk about. You know, I try to be extreme in how I present things so I can get opinions like yours, right? And I think it's a perfect question that we need to kind of resolve as a culture or as a society. You know, why are people, you know, we live in a very interesting society where like you said, the increase, uh, population is decreasing and uh, you know, the older generation is you know, controlling their society. Why are 70-year-olds 70, 70 voting for our generation? Right? I mean, the voting system is all kind of, voting system is kind of interesting um, uh, aspect to talk about that when we turn, talk about education and how we, we disperse the tax. If I may, just 30 seconds on this, which is, uh, if you go back and read the rescript on education, not a lot of it is about education. It's about education in the context of a larger society. And it's worth going back and reading that. You may disagree with some of the stuff that's in it about what those externalities are, but it's very much worth reading. Let me go first here and then uh, to the back. You had a, a, a comment? Thank you. We'll get the other side soon. I'd like to uh, uh, bring the question back to uh, AI. I might. I'm a member of the AI research community and professor in that area. And of course, we're always getting hit with people like Elon Musk saying how terrible we're going to make the world and all that. <laughs> so we have panels on this. And uh, the panels focus on a question about the future much further out than this panel has discussed the future. Uh, and, uh, but it, they first jump back to the Industrial Revolution and then the revolution from agriculture to cities. So we're talking about 1800 and 1900, and they point out that uh, things worked out fine. There was all this panic about how are people's jobs going to be affected by the Industrial Revolution, and it worked out fine. Agricultural Revolution seemed to work out fine. But some people say this revolution is different it's not going to work out fine. Uh, we're going to take the jobs away, both in white collar and blue collar. Uh, I agree with you about the narrowness, of course, but narrowness over time expands, and we're going to get all the jobs. What is your opinion? What is the panel's opinion about the real future? Uh, is, the fourth, is this fourth wave going to be different? Okay. Let me get two or three questions, and then we'll uh, get the answers if we may. So AI first, next year, and maybe somebody from the other side of the room. It's tilting to the left. Yeah. Um, it's the yeah, right for uh, me. I, first of all, I think we all embrace the speed of technology and all the positive benefits for society. Last year I was involved on one of the task forces for the G20 summit when it was in Germany, and we spent a year looking at disruption. Uh, so I just want to give a little bit of reality. 
By 2015, we by by 2025, we estimate six million transport jobs will be destroyed in the U.S. We estimate 92 percent of what an attorney does will be automated by AI within the next five years. <laughs> but, but I mean, yes. this is real disruption. It is very different than the agricultural revolution. So uh, my question back on this is loving technology, but our political leaders and our education system, whether it's Japan, the US, or Europe, is completely unprepared for the severity of this transformation in the next 10 to 15 years. How do we build policies and strategies to transition with minimal impact and leverage the upside. Okay. Last question from here. Thank you. Uh, so very quick question. We talked about education and kind of that being the future of work is that we're going to have our, our kids will be in the workforce, ideally. Um, what do we think about the ROI of having kids all together? Uh, and I think the you know a very large theme of Shoshka and how we are declining kind of population, but you know women can either go into the workforce, have kids. Is it possible to do both? Um, and how would we look at that from this kind of pure brutal number? number very percentage? interesting <laughs> question. Thanks. Let's start with the two AI questions. Uh, maybe Daniel, if you could start. Um, sure. Um, and yeah, I think I, uh, what I'll say um, definitely touches on uh, both of the uh, both of the questions. Um, so it's challenging for economists and, and futurists, I think, in general, uh, to see 10 years ahead, much less 100 years ahead. But I definitely, you know, while I've heard you know, the stories about how, um, yes, you know, we've had the, the, the agriculture revolution, the, the industrial revolution, and yes, it all turned out fine, I, I, I kind of push back a little bit because I, I agree that it was actually tremendously traumatic uh, for the people who were actually living in the time um, uh, uh, to make that transition. And actually the agricultural revolution and the industrial revolution were, were you know, deeply um, uh, uh, disruptive. Um, you know, the United States, for example, had to move from um, a society where 90% of the people worked in the agricultural sector um, to, you know, uh, I think now less than 2%, um, I believe. So, no, these are vast um, uh, uh, social shifts and uh, I think you know culturally we sort of saw that uh, sort of you know, emerge in uh, uh, you know like the works of Charles Dickens, for example, right? Um, uh, you know, as people had to move uh, to you know uh, work in in damp, squalid, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 polluting polluting factories. But I have kind of enduring faith um, that uh, uh, you know human ingenuity um, uh, can always overcome you know these these challenges. I, I I fundamentally believe that these are surmountable challenges. Definitely very real challenges. Um, it's definitely going to test the limits um, of our current you know political, economic, social institutions. I suspect that they're also going to have to radically um, evolve. Um, uh, uh, to um, survive um, and and prosper uh, in these new climates, but at the same time, uh, um, you know, people, you know, covering uh, energy and and other commodities things, you always sort of confront doomsayers who say, you know, uh, this is going to be the end of of the world. This is going to be the end of time. We're going to run out of oil, or we're going to run out of technology. We're going to run out of this or that. Always so far, human ingenuity um, has prevailed um, ultimately um, against all these challenges. A um, hundred years from now, what exactly form will that take? Um, uh, you know, will we say be in a transhuman society where we can sort of channel the you know forces of technology onto ourselves to the point where we're not recognizably even human anymore. I mean, this is, again, the, the realm of speculation and science fiction, but if I had to make a bet as an asset manager and a former you know, person who worked in finance, I would definitely bet on, on human ingenuity innovation. That, that's a great word, human ingenuity. Yeah, that's a great word. I'm going to throw one question at you because we're running out of time. If you lost your job now to the impact of AI, or new technologies, what would you do? You have a family to run, you have to live. What are you gonna do? Are you gonna just sit in your sofa and watch TV? If, what if Japan had a big earthquake and we lost 90% of our economy? What are you going to do? 
Are you going to live here without any pay or salary? Look at the immigrants that moved to the U.S. back in the day, whether they were Japanese, Chinese, or from Latin America. What did they do when they had nothing? What, do, what would you do? I mean, I believe in humans, the change. Human in Trinity. Great word. I'm going to use that. <laughs> First thing I would do is sign up for BizReach. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would just talk about the return on children. Um, uh, the, in economics, return on children, children and some, children? Children are seen either as consumption or as investment. Uh, for consumption, you get utility from children. As investment, in the Gary Becker's investment, uh, you get return when children get older, when, when you can't work, you get return from their income, as the income stream comes from your children. So children can be both consumption, investment, but it can be public goods as well. But anyway, it's, uh, is children investment today? Yes, yes. We get pension, we get medicine from the younger generation. The old elderly gets all that through the Japanese social system. And so the children is a very great investment and return is huge. And I think the country which enables younger generation to have children is the winner in the present day. Whereas Japan, East Asian countries, other East Asian countries, or many, some European countries too, which cannot have children like just total fertility rate, rate of like 1 point, below 1.3, Japan is 1.4 now, is, it's kind of losing. So I, I would like to say that return on children is enormous and we have to really think about it and support it. The, fam uh, the, the state should support it and we should support this. What you're saying is that there's a difference between the social return and the private return. Yeah. And then there's a variance issue too, but let, 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 let's not go there. So, anyway, we're, our time's up, so we have to end the panel now. I'm sure there are plenty more questions. Let me thank you for joining us today and thank our panelists for a very, very